By now you've probably already seen a bunch of M4 MacBook Air unboxings. It looks almost the same as last year. A 10 core M4 chip, up to 32 gigabytes of unified memory, wafer thin body, two lonely USB-C ports, and of course a slick new color. But the real story this year is under the hood. Proper Thunderbolt 4 lanes this time, and a surprise ability to run two external 4K screens plus the built-in screen. I've used every single Apple Silicon Air machine ever since well apple silicon m1 and after a month with the m4 i'm here to show you the real dev results docker code builds local llm tests the stuff that matters to software developers and with apple giving us more ram options than actual ports which config should you get i got some suggestions as we go through the video the short version is that the M4 keeps boosting single core power while also speeding up multi-core tasks. Because each core is now faster, so everything is going to be faster. Geekbench single core reflects everyday snappiness, JavaScript applications in your browser. Multi-core measures how fast you can handle actual parallel jobs like Docker images or heavy code compiles. We've come a long way. Since M1 to M2 was about a 15% jump, M2 to M3 about 17%, and now the M4 sees around 23% gains over the M3. That's pretty good news for your dev environment. This means you can expect slightly shorter compile times, smoother multi-container Docker spins, and fast hot reloads. And remember, all these MacBook Airs, the Apple Silicon varieties, are fanless. The Intel one had a fan and still has a fan. It's pretty loud, actually. You've probably seen it in my videos. Well, that means that under really heavy marathon loads, you can lose a bit of that top performance. When the machine gets really hot, it starts to throttle. And that means about 5 to 10% less speed than the peak benchmark would suggest. All right, let's get practical. Real developer work is build, run, break, rebuild. And I did actually stress this M4 Air for the last month or so with every coding task that I could muster. It's actually been more than a month, but a month looks nicer in a title. I've actually gone through some of these in more detail in some of the videos, but here's the recap. Even though I'm not a C++ developer, I did some C++ tests. Quick sort on 10 million integers took about 2 minutes, 34 seconds, and that's 26 seconds faster than the M3. Makes sense? Single core, but full core merge sort took about 2 minutes, 31 seconds, almost a minute faster than the M3 huge gains there. So obviously the more cores you use, the better gains you're going to see. Python Mandelbrot test that I usually do, it's an interpreted bit of code that uses all the CPU cores as well. Finished in 34 seconds, beating last year's time by 15 seconds. That's crazy. And of course, speedometer 3.0, single core operations there. Chrome hit 49.3, about four points higher than the M3. So pretty good. Now that's not the only story here. Since this comes with 16 gigabytes to start and 32 at the maximum, I tested those machines against each other in a video, separate video with more details, but just to give you a taste, this is where more memory really counts. I built a big NX mono repo in three minutes and eight seconds on the 16 gigabyte model, but on the 32, it dipped to two minutes and 12 seconds. And I did a huge .NET project compilation with 100,000 namespaces and classes. Compilation took 94 seconds on the 16 gigabyte version and 69 seconds on the 32 gigabyte version. Pretty big difference there. Finally, Docker Compose spinning up 100 containers took about 20 seconds on the 16 gigabyte machine and 19 on the 32. Not that much of a difference in that case. Big difference on local LLMs. Pretty popular topic these days, especially on this channel. You all keep asking me about that all the time. I ran Deep Sea Coder 1.5 billion. Small model, but gives us an idea of what happens. It breezed at 55 tokens per second on the 16 gigabyte model and 63 on the 32. Last year, I showed how an 8 gigabyte machine runs pretty much everything. There's a few things that didn't run very well. I have a video on that. But most of the time, you're going to be okay with 8 gigabytes as long as you're not running too many things at the same time, obviously. But it's surprising what Mac OS can actually handle in those cases. But 16, you've got a lot more room to move around. But once you push bigger to .NET builds, for example, with giant mono repos, the extra RAM shaves off big chunks of time. And of course, the 32 gigabyte machine, which I nicknamed the MacBook Air, Pro. We're getting more and more pro every year, actually. That one's going to give you a lot more room to spread out. You can have a lot more things running at the same time and not feel the effects of things slowing down. For example, in my normal dev day is four terminal panes open running git commands and npm scripts, a couple of instances of VS code. I have Xcode with an iOS simulator running and occasionally I run the Android emulator, which is a beast. But this year, actually, they've done a good job with uh, optimizing it a little bit more and it runs a little bit smoother than the previous years. Docker Desk 
desktop sleeps until I really need it, but Chrome stays open with at least 25 tabs. And during this whole time, the OS stays responsive, even on a 16 gigabyte machine. App switching is instant, except those times when I fire up Android Studio and Docker containers all at the same time. That's when I feel a little bit of a half second hiccup. It's kind of like cramming too many people into a small car. Somebody's gonna have to wait for a seat. Come on, let the old lady sit down, you rude person, you. Now, if you're expecting marathon loads or multiple virtual machines, maybe even the MacBook Air is not enough for you if you're doing that kind of stuff. In which case, you're probably gonna wanna dive into a MacBook Pro. And I actually tested the 32 gigabyte MacBook Air versus the 16 gigabyte MacBook Pro because they were the same price when they came out. Same M4 chip. The Pro, of course, has a few more features, like uh, it's a little thicker, and more heat is spreading around. It has a fan, so it's gonna suck that air out or blow whatever you want to call it so it's got more thermal headroom it also has a better screen of course with more hertz but here's a summary on how it did on some tests that i ran c plus plus quick sort single core the pro finished in 2 minutes 33 seconds while the 32 gigabyte air took 2 minutes and 36 seconds obviously they have the same cores same chip so very close but maybe that fan in the pro helped the clock speeds just a little bit C++ Merge Sort, all the cores all at once. Two minutes and 18 seconds on the Pro versus two minutes and 26 seconds on the Air. Here we saw the Pro's cooling actually give an edge to a sustained load. That huge .NET compilation with 100,000 classes, 69 seconds on the 32 gigabyte Air and 87 seconds on the 16 gigabyte Pro. Wow, that extra RAM saves you from swapping, so the Air crushed that test. The Air beat the Pro. The Mandelbrot Python test, 29 seconds on the Pro, 34 on the Air. Again, this is using all the cores and it's pretty intense. So I think the fan helped out here again. So if your job is mostly huge CPU sprints, the pros fans keeps higher speeds under load. If you need more than 16 gigabytes of memory and do mostly short builds, the 32 gigabyte air can outrun a pro on RAM heavy tasks and it stays silent. Okay, real talk, dropping two grand on a MacBook up front, that's a whole car repair or a vacation or half a Thunderbolt dock. So here's a smarter move, upgraded. They let you pick the exact MacBook you want, custom specs, more RAM, extra storage, and instead of paying everything up front, you spread it out over 36 months. Interest starts from 0%, depending on your eligibility. Even better, after 24 months, you just send the MacBook back in the box that they give you, and boom, new MacBook time, no sketchy marketplace listings, no is this still available messages at 2 a.m. They work with Apple Premier Partners, they have a 4.8 Trustpilot rating, and yeah, even folks from OpenAI back them. The best part is you can keep the cash you didn't drop up front, earning 4% interest in a savings account. So go to getupgraded.com, link in the description, use code Alex40 and get 40 bucks off your next MacBook. That's getupgraded.com, code Alex40. There was a few days when I went on a trip and I spent full work days relying only on the 16 gigabyte M4 Air. Even with VS Code, Xcode, Chrome, Notion, Docker Compose running, I saw no real lag. At worst, macOS swapped out about one gigabyte. That's when it's using the SSD instead of the RAM when everything doesn't fit into RAM. Not a good thing to have happen. So keep an eye on that if you have a low memory machine and you're using a lot of applications at the same time. But nonetheless, window switching felt smooth. Programs pop back in pretty easily. Now I did notice that after 10 minute full core compile, the palm rest warmed up to around 46 degrees. Not painful, but definitely toasty compared to older models. In fact, coming back to the M4 Air and putting your palms on it, it's always a little bit surprising because the palm rests are warm. Whereas in the previous models, they're kind of cool. So you expect that. So that's something new. Not great, but it's new. As far as battery goes, it seems like I could leave this thing on for days and it'll just keep working and not running out of battery. But I wanted to be a little bit more scientific about it. So... I said a little bit more scientific, not a lot, okay? Just calm down, calm down. Calm down. I did my developer loop, which I call it now. It's a dev test that I run that simulates what a dev would do, what I would do actually. Not all devs do the same stuff, but it has a, a bunch of programs open, like things that I use, Notion. It's got a little bit of music playing. The screen is set to full brightness. To do is uh, 15 browser tabs. I have a couple of instances of terminal open, VS code, and it runs through a loop, a half an hour loop of things that we do, like coding, building code, running interpreted code, basically things that I covered already, but in a loop. And of course, watching videos is one of the things that we do. I know you do that. I just know it. I have a feeling. How do I know this? I don't know. You tell me. I actually ran this one twice and got about the same results on both the uh, 32 gigabyte version and the 16 gigabyte version. Now the M4 MacBook Air actually has a slightly bigger battery, 53.8 watt hours 
as opposed to 52.6 from last year, the M3. And look at these two, the M3 MacBook Air and the M4 MacBook Air are very close to the number of minutes that they lasted under my test. About 330 minutes for the M3. The M4 lasted just a little bit less, 315. Maybe if you interpolate that line down, it's gonna be like 328 or something like that, but very close. How does this compare with some of these other machines that I tested? There's the Galaxy Book with the X Elite, the MacBook Pro 14, the M4 version, lasted a little bit longer than both of those. It's got a slightly bigger battery. Here's the M4 Pro, lasted quite a bit longer. The M2 Max is over here, a two-year-old machine that I've been daily driving. So yeah, the battery's gonna go down a little bit. And here's the MacBook Pro 16 M4 Max. That's my current daily driver. Just about the same as the M3 MacBook Air. If there's anything that lasted a significant amount longer, here's the Surface Laptop 7 with the X Elite chip inside of it. That one lasted the longest. But we're all in the territory now where we don't really need to care about charging our laptop throughout the day. If you're working normal days and you're not Elon Musk who works 18 hour days, then you may be okay. That's what he said anyway. I I don't know, maybe that he said that. Don't quote me on that. So let's talk about who benefits from this upgrade. The M4 Air is still a paper thin laptop that slips into a backpack easily. With Apple's latest chip, it can handle serious dev tasks on the go, no problem. So for students and general developers, if you're in class or meetings all day, coding, note taking or Zoom calling, you last eight to 10 hours on battery, no problem. You also won't distract the room with fan noise. A second benefit, people that are traveling, this is really nice. I've been really enjoying carrying something like this as opposed to the large MacBook Pro, especially when I'm walking around with my backpack, it really makes a big difference. It also will fit on cramped airplane trays. I brought a prop. This is the size of a typical airplane tray. Here's the MacBook Pro 16 inch. Where do you put your mouse? Where do you put your food? Where do you put your coffee? And here is the MacBook Air M4, M2, M3, same size. You have a little bit more room to work with. Candy bar goes here. I don't know, your chicken nuggets go here. You can also charge it with a smaller USB-C adapter, a power brick that perhaps you're borrowing because you forgot yours. If you crave more ports, built-in HDMI, or need that 120 hertz display, the MacBook Pro is the one to go with, of course. But I'm gonna tell you this, if you're used to 60 hertz, don't, don't spoil, spoil yourself. yourself. Don't, don't try, try the 120, the 120, 120 hertz, hertz MacBook, MacBook Pro, Pro display. display. It's, gonna it's gonna ruin you. It's gonna, it's gonna spoil, spoil your, your day. day because you're gonna, you're gonna want, want it. it. However, after working on the MacBook Air for that trip that I did for a while, you kind of get used to 60 Hertz again. There is a little bit of a difference, you notice it, but it's something you can get used to, especially if all you're doing is just looking at code. That's not all we're doing, is it? We're watching YouTube too. Also the MacBook Pro, the fan gives you better sustained speeds. So if you got large compilations to do, it's gonna be a little faster. If your tasks are small and fit inside two minute bursts, the Air can match or beat the Pro, especially with that 32 gigabyte version. So if you are going with the Air, here's some recommended builds. For everyday work, 16 gigabytes of RAM, one terabyte SSD, that's fine. Apple charges a lot for those upgrades of the storage and it just, ah, uh, you can get something like this. Easy. It's another thing to carry around, I know, but if you want to just throw it in a backpack, and if you already have a backpack, then it's not such a big deal to carry extra stuff with you, but data only, not programs, of course. So if you have a lot of programs, like Xcode is a honker, right? Android Studio is big, Docker, all those programs are gonna add up. 256 gigabytes that I have on the base model here, it's a headache. After Xcode, Android SDKs, Docker images, node modules, you're already almost out of space after installing all that stuff, forget virtual machines. 512 gigabytes works if you move large assets to an external drive, but you'll also be worried about constant space management. One terabyte right now is pretty good. It gives you enough room to breathe. You can stash multiple virtual machines, plus local Git clones, maybe a couple of small LLMs. For heavy multitasking, 32 gigs of RAM is a really good option this year, especially on a MacBook Air. It's pretty amazing that Apple added that option. There's also the 24 gigabyte option, and I'm not too sure about that one. I don't know, yeah, it's there, but if you need RAM, get 32. If you don't need that much RAM, go for 16. 24 is like, it's like you can't decide. But if you get more RAM, you're not gonna be sorry. If you get less RAM, you might be sorry. So the M4 Air keeps its single core supremacy. If your compiles stay under two minutes, it actually rivals a 16 gigabyte MacBook Pro. It runs warm enough to notice, but not too hot enough to harm performance. It will throttle if you go push it too hard. But also in the winter time, you can think of it as a built-in hand warmer. 
The thing has silence and stamina. Eight coating hours, still near half the battery and no fan noise is a beautiful thing to see at the end of the day. So the sweet spot is 16 gigabytes of RAM, one terabyte of storage. Go 32 if you can, you won't be sorry if you do and avoid the 256 gigabyte storage tier if you value your sanity. If that profile matches your workflow, the M4 Air might be the most portable dev laptop you can buy. Also, don't forget, if you do need more ports, you can always get a little gadget like this. I have a couple of other docks. This one is easy because it doesn't have a power plug. It's not Thunderbolt, but it just gives you more stuff, even an HDMI port. I'll leave a link to that one down below. It's pretty nice. I think that's going to wrap it up, folks. Thanks for watching, and I will see you in the next video.